good morning and welcome everybody to Concord. I just want to say we are so excited that each and every one of you guys are here. I need you to hear me say that. We are excited that you are here to help us kick off this Christmas season. And can you believe we're saying that? That it is now the Christmas season. I mean, it just seems like we started this year and here we are together in Christmas time. And, and I got to tell you, I mean, Christmas is a big deal for the church, is it not? I mean, it is huge. What you need to understand is not just our culture, but what this means for you as a child of God. We are celebrating the giving of the Savior of the world. That God put skin on, that the Savior, the Messiah, the promised one, God has come through, and it is time to celebrate. Christmas is a game changer for you and me as a believer, is it not? And I've got to tell you, this month leading up to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we are going to be trying to take you and your family, the people around you, your friends, on a journey on a journey towards Christ that's going to be filled with courage, that's going to be filled with commitment to saying, Jesus, you are who you say you are, and I want to see the world change. We have got to lean in in this time of year of our calling to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Christmas is when people are open to seeing people live out their faith. And we are going to be all December proclaiming the kingdom of God in our homes, our community, and the world. Jesus is worth everything, is he not? I'm so excited about what we are getting done. This We're starting a brand new series today called Christmas Convos. These Christmas Convos looking at how God spoke through his messengers to different people within the Christmas account. And it's going to be an amazing time leading right up to when we celebrate the birth of Christ. And so I want to tell you a little bit about that day we celebrate, which is Christmas Eve. You know, it, it always changes on the weekend what it looks like with Christmas services. But I want to tell you a little bit about it. We are going to have service on December 24th. That is a Sunday. Christmas Eve is Sunday. And so we will have our normal service times where we will have our Christmas candlelight service here at Claremont at 9.30 and 11 and at Yona and Dahlonega, we're going to have it at 11 o'clock. Those will be the service times for our candlelight service. But what I've been sharing with you is this. I want the people of Concord to be praying to be sharing your Jesus story in this time and be bringing people with you. I, I, I've, I've said this over and over, and even as I was practicing this sermon, it's the sticking point for me. This next statement that I'm going to say is my hope. I want everybody to make eye contact as much as you can. Campuses through the screen. Hear me on this. My hope for you this month, this December, is that God would use you to lead somebody to Christ. Like that's my hope as your pastor, not that you just invite them to candlelight service and not try to catch on fire or something, but I want you to be used by God to truly lead somebody to Christ. So students, listen to me. I want you to pray bold prayers, that you are praying, God, work in my soccer team. Work in my homeroom class. God, do something praying big, bold prayers. Young adults, young professionals, young married, this is what I want for you. I want you to share Jesus. People are looking for truth in your generation. They're searching everywhere for it. And you have the story of how Jesus can take something busted and broken and make it brand new. Families, I gotta tell you, you gotta make room you got to open up some extra seats at your table at the house. you got to say no to a few things on your calendar to make room for people in your life this month. Senior adults don't think you're getting out of this. There is a generation who thinks that they have been no longer needed in culture or in the church. And they need somebody to say, won't you come with me as we pursue Jesus? I want us to be a church that this December that people are leading folks to Christ. 
And we're praying, God, give us legitimate, give us lasting revival. No more just holidays around the church. Bring revival. So if you're a first-time visitor, this is what you get, all right? This is what we're about. We love the Lord and we love people. That's why we're always putting an emphasis on who you do in life with, who you bring in with you, who's sitting at your dinner table, who are you talking to, who are you praying for, because relationships are important. And as we talk about relationships, this series is gonna hit all over it. I mean, think about how relationships take time and intentionality. Do you remember when you had time for stuff? I mean, I want everybody to go back in your mind and go back maybe to your childhood. And do you remember when you had time to get bored? I mean, some of you are like, that was a long time ago, right? But you would think about as a kid, what you would do. You would get home from school and then what? I mean, you'd get your buddies out in the street and you'd find a ball, any ball, and you'd play football in the street and the, the mailboxes were the markers of the end zone, right? Or you'd get a Frisbee and you'd throw it on a house and what would you do? You would climb on the neighbor's roof. Maybe if you're like me, we would build ramps in the street and we would ride our bikes everywhere. Or out in the woods, you'd build a fort or a tree house and you would spend time with your friends and communicating. And that's what we're gonna talk about, communicating and, and conversations. And so if you go back to your childhood and you think about that fort or you think about that tree house, how did you communicate, right? Maybe it looked something like this. Y'all know, know this right here? Here, let me, let, me, let me see if I can get you right there, all right? Now, let's, let's talk about this. Aaron, can you hear me? Oh, I have a microphone. You think that ruins this illustration? A little bit. Okay, all right. Here, here we go. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that back, all right? But think about this. Just with your buddies, you would have that phone and you could go from place to place and just as long as the string would go would be how far that communication would go. But then, I don't know if you're like this, maybe you're like me and this is my grandmother's phone. How many of y'all remember a good rotary phone? Right, show of hands. All right, and you don't have to punch numbers in, you get to watch it spin, right? But the thing is, is you would have to stand right where this was because that's as far as it would go. But then as your conversations change from calling your parents or calling a friend, all of a sudden, it depended when you talked to your crush how long your corded phone was, right? I mean, because this would be plugged into the wall and you would try to get it as long as possible so you could go all the way inside of your room and close the door, right? Because you didn't want anybody here and you say, no, you hang up first. I'm not gonna hang up first. You hang up first. All I wanna do is talk on the phone with you and then somebody starts you know, taking the cord going, hey, get off the phone. But then there was a game changer in conversation. When it was no longer how far you could pull the cord, it was Zach Morris in the 90s. <laughs> it was a game changer. I mean, because now your phone is mobile. You can go wherever you want and have a conversation. What's funny is my kids had this in the car yesterday and they're like, how do you even carry that with you? Like you had to have a bag, right? But these conversations now could happen anywhere and anytime. And I know all of you under 25 are going, who even talks on the phone? My whole conversation with my friend group is through memes. Like that's how we talk. You just look and it's just picture, 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 right? But here's the thing, we all love conversation. We love communicating, whether you uh, realize the cup phone or maybe the rotary phone or, or the long cable or the mobile phone or texting your friends. Conversations are important to relationships, are they not? I mean, it's so important to communicate with one another. But think about this. More than your crush or more than a friend or more than your family, what happens when the God of the universe, the creator of the world, speaks to you? I mean, it is a changing, life-altering thing when God 
speaks of you. And so, uh, speaks to you. And so over the next several weeks, what I wanna invite you to do is take a journey with me in scripture. To look at times where God spoke to people telling him what he was going to do in their life that would take great amounts of faith. Now, I know many of you, even at all the campuses, received a note sheet today. I wanna encourage you, there are four notes for you to take. You can write in the boxes, cross-references, whatever you want, but I wanna encourage you to take notes today. And so if you've got a copy of God's Word with you or a a non-rotary phone, go ahead and, and get to Luke chapter one. That's where we're gonna spend the majority of our time together today is in the gospel of Luke. If you're new to the Bible, open it to the middle, go to the right. You'll get to your New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John, Luke chapter one. And today we're gonna look at a conversation that was had with a man named Zechariah that God spoke to through an angel. Most of you may not know who Zechariah was. If it helps for clarity, it was Elizabeth's husband. If you need further clarity, it's John the Baptist's dad. If you need further clarity, he was the forerunner of Christ. That is who the Lord is going to uh, choose to talk to. And church, this is my hope today. That today's passage would not only draw you closer to Christ, but it would be medicine for the soul of the one who's been faithful and for years and years have prayed to God and you haven't gotten the answer yet and you get discouraged and you get weary and yet God has a plan, God has an answer and God has a time. Now his answer may not be the one you want His timing may not be in your mind the perfect time. And his plan may be something more than you ever imagined. But I got to tell you, I want to encourage you today. Keep the faith. Trust God no matter what. So here's the first note I want you to take this morning, and it's this. Stay faithful when you feel forgotten. I'm going to call you a believer child of God, to stay faithful even when you feel forgotten. Now, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands here, but I I, I would like you just to answer in your heart, how many of you have ever gone through a period of time in your faith where you feel like God has forgotten you? Where you've been serving faithfully? You've been praying diligently? You've been using your gifts and your talents You have been giving everything every day to the Lord, praying and praying, calling on the Lord, and yet you haven't been able to discern his answer yet. You understand because you read scripture that you know that God hears you, and you ask yourself, why is he not given an answer yet? You're tempted time after time to lose heart. Am I preaching just to myself here? You're tempted to lose heart, but you keep grinding, you keep being faithful. Your, your encouragement it just wanes at times and you become discouraged, but I wanna tell you, we have to stay faithful even when we feel forgotten. See, Zechariah and Elizabeth knew this story all too well. But see, God was about to do something in them and through them that would change history forever. Look at Luke chapter one, verse five. It says, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, I want you to pause right there because this is a time where King Herod is is not a Jewish descent, but has been empowered as king of the Jews by the Roman Empire. To say the least, it is turbulent times in Israel. I mean, it is going crazy in this nation. There is, there, is, there is chaos going on according to what they would choose. And Zechariah the priest, and get this, Zechariah's name, get this, means God remembers. 
And it says, he's serving in the temple by his division. Go back to 1 Chronicles 24. It'll outline all the divisions and how there's, there's 24 divisions and they serve a week, a year, and there's all of these priests. And uh, it's, it's an amazing thing. But they are literally living, Zechariah and Elizabeth, in a busted and broken world. Sound familiar to anyone? It says in verse 6, and they were both righteous before God. I want to remind you, when I put it in yellow, that's my emphasis, but I want you to see something. It says, and they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. I highlighted both because I want you to understand this. Zechariah and Elizabeth both had their own faith. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly. But even though they were faithful, they still had struggles. Can I tell you something, church, that's hard to hear, but you need to hear it? Faith and righteousness don't exempt us from hurt, heartache, and strife. Amen? Just because you're faithful, just because you're living in the right way in a corrupt world and culture, does not mean you are exempt from hard things. Can you imagine how impassioned they have been praying for years? And yet, no matter how they felt or no matter what answer they got, they stayed faithful. They chose to trust God. Look in verse 7. It says, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and were advanced in years. They had a struggle. They had an unmet desire. And yet, they stayed faithful. Faithful, They chose to trust God's answer, God's timing, and God's plan. Faithful husband and wife, no child, faithfully serving the Lord. Here's our second note. God was working a plan for his glory. God was working a plan for his glory, not our glory, not our want, not our comfort, but God, the one who spoke the world into existence, was working a plan for his glory. Students, listen to me. He was doing something so much bigger than right now. I know right now is so important, but I got to tell you, God was working out a plan. The Savior was coming. The time had come. Things were about to get jump-started here in the next uh, year or two. God was doing a work, and he was about to blow Zach and Liz's mind because they were going to get to be involved. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Now, while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, According to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And now as you read that, it may feel very random that he was chosen by lot to go in. This would probably happen in a priest's life once, that their division would be on duty, that it would be chosen by lot, that they would go in and offer the incense. And it may seem by chance, but can I tell you something? God doesn't do accidental. God doesn't do random. I mean, I want you to write this down as a, uh, as a cross-reference on your note sheet to look how much control God has over lots. And spoiler alert, it's all of it. <laughs> Proverbs 16.33 says this, the lot is cast into the lap but it's every decision is from the Lord. God is sovereign. He's sovereign. See, this opportunity wasn't by happenstance. It wasn't by luck. God was creating an opportunity for a conversation with Zechariah. God was going to speak. In verse 10 of Luke chapter 1, it says this, and the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. I love that because it's such a unique detail. He was standing on the right side. 
Verse 12, and Zechariah was troubled when he saw and fear fell on him. Y'all, Zech was shaken. I mean, he was gripped with fear. And then a conversation started. And this angel is going to speak and give him six pieces of information. Look at this in verse 13. It says, but the angel said to him, don't be afraid. Fear came all on him. And the first thing he gave him was a word of comfort. Hey, hold on. Don't be scared. For your prayer has been heard. Hey, don't be scared. God has heard you. And your wife, Elizabeth, she'll bear a son. And you'll call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Guys, can you imagine this? Put yourself in Zechariah's, uh, uh, you know, shoes for a minute. Maybe his sandals, all right? You're in there. God has lined up an opportunity. You are serving the Lord faithfully. And all of a sudden, boom, an angel shows up. He has gone from intense fear to validation. Hey, God's heard. And more than that, God's going to answer. Can you imagine the emotional chaos he is feeling? He's scared, but now he's validated. Then he says, there's going to be joy in your life. And not only that, people are going to rejoice at the birth of your son. How would you process this conversation? I mean, how would you walk through something like this? The closest thing I can think of is a time I had a conversation with my dad. I was a, a senior in high school, I think, and my dad had brought, bought a brand new car. I mean, we were high rolling in a brand new Ford Contour. <laughs> and I said, Dad, I know you've had this car like a couple of weeks, but homecoming is around the corner. Any way I can borrow your new car and, and take my date to the dance? Sure, son, go ahead. And I remember, I, I think I dropped her off at home. And on the way back to my house before curfew, I made a stop at Taco Bell. Fine dining. I was about to turn in and a guy came out of nowhere and clipped the back of the car. Totally his fault, hit me on the way to Taco Bell. And I remember going, I've got to call my dad. My dad's going to murder me. His brand new car. And I remember grabbing a phone and calling my dad. And it was late at night. And he answered. He said, hello. I said, hey, dad, I've been in a wreck. Expecting him to yell and scream at me. He said, are you okay? Those three words took me from fear to fearless. Are you okay? My dad, in three words, had said, you are way more important than this car. You are way more important than any expectation of perfection. You are way more important. I just want to make sure you're okay. And can I tell you, for a high school kid, that put steel in concrete in the foundation of my relationship with my dad. Three words to say, are you okay? begin to change the way I viewed my relationship with my father. And there were times then in college and in adulthood and still now today that I call him and go, Dad, you're not gonna believe this. This is what happens. How do I handle this? Because I saw in that moment that he heard me and that he cared about me. And this angel with Zechariah, after being faithful and praying and the burden of his wife wanting a child, he has come before God and he has now shown up and said, I'm answering. I've heard. But he not only speaks to Zechariah, he begins to change the focus and talk about this child he's going to have that would not just change their family, but change the world and generations that we're a part of to come. In Luke chapter 1, verse 15, he goes on, he says, for he will be great before the Lord. He puts standards on his life and he says, he must not drink wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. 
And he will, turn, uh, he will turn many of the children of Israel to their God. He would lead a ministry of repentance. Repent means to turn. He's gonna turn the children's hearts back to the Lord, verse 17, and he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready, get this, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Y'all, this is what we have recorded as some of the first communication in over 400 years to the people of God. Go back to Malachi chapter four, verses five and six, and it says this. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Those are some of the last words they heard, and now we've got one that's gonna help people turn their hearts to God. 400 years later, put that in perspective. America's like 250 from the beginning. And now God has spoken. Look, in Mark chapter one, verses four and five, we see John's ministry and it says, and John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism, watch this, of repentance, of turning for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem was going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Can you imagine one conversation with a faithful man serving in the church? God said, I've heard you. And now people from all over the country are coming to repent of their sins and be baptized. Powerful stuff, y'all. Powerful stuff. God was working a plan for his glory. People turning to him. And guys, isn't that what we need today? Don't we need people to turn to him? So much of we turn to ourself or we turn to our friend groups. That's what I love. 15-year-olds asking advice of other 15-year-olds on how to do life. 30-year-olds asking other 30-year-olds on how to do life. We trust ourselves. We trust in our tactics. We trust in our all the things of this world when we need to trust in Christ. Turn our hearts to him. People need to turn to Jesus and oh, that you and I could play a part in that as individuals that God would allow us to be a part of his plan, not just us, but Concord. But so far, this has been a one-sided conversation, right? We're gonna see Zechariah respond and it doesn't really go well. Luke chapter one, verse 18 says this, and Zechariah said to the angel, well, then how am I supposed to know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. See, here's a man that's been praying, 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 and then God goes, yes. And he's like, well, hold on. We ever get like that with God? Where we pray and pray and pray and then he answers and you're like, well, mm, yeah, this is not really how I would do it. We get picky or we're like, well, I'm not really sure you know what you're talking about, God. And we let confusion and doubt creep in in our life. But I love this because then the angel kind of flexes on him a little bit. It's crazy. Watch this in verse 19. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I was spent, uh, sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. Check it out. He goes, well, how am I supposed to know that you're for real, that you can do this? And he goes, hold on. Maybe you've forgotten who you're talking to. I come from the throne room of Almighty God, and I was sent to tell you this from him. I mean, he just puts Zech in his place. Verse 20, he goes on and says, Behold, you'll be silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time. He said, listen, you prayed and God answered and you're asking, how am I gonna know this is for real? Hey, you're dealing with God Almighty. The one who speaks the world into existence, I think your advanced in years wife can have a child if God says so. 
And this silence brings us to our third point to write down, which is this. Times of silence can solidify your faith. Times of silence can solidify your faith. See, God had prayed, or Zechariah had prayed to God, and God said yes. And see, then Zechariah got caught up in the, possi- uh, the probability, not the possibility. And Gabriel, named angel, the last time we see him is in the book of Daniel when he's delivering a message from God. Says, until this is fulfilled, Zechariah, you're gonna grab a little hush. Your mouth is gonna be closed. He rebukes his doubt. And unable to speak is where I believe Zechariah's faith was solidified in what God was gonna do. In God's answer, in God's timing, And according to God's plan, was going to be more than he thought possible. Now watch in verse 21. And the people were waiting for Zechariah. And they were wondering about his delay in the temple. Because after the the priest would go in and offer the incense, he would come out and pronounce a blessing over the people. Verse 22, and he came out and he was unable to speak to them and they realized he had seen a vision in the temple and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. Check this out. He encounters an angel of God who comes from God's presence to answer a prayer, to speak about what is going to happen. He gets rebuked and becomes mute. And he kept serving. He didn't call in. He didn't cancel. He didn't say, hey, I'll come back next time. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. That's how I read it. Verse 24, and these days his wife Elizabeth conceived and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, thus the Lord has done for me in these days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Church, I got to wonder, what could God solidify in your faith if you would be silent? If you'd stop working through that same list, that same habit, that same rote memory thing, and just got quiet before God. I mean, what could he speak to you? So many times we treat our prayer life with God like a bad junior high relationship. One person talks and the other one's just glad to be there. And we talk and talk and talk, not even to God, but at God. And we don't wait for him to speak to us. I've done this with our church before, and I want to encourage you to do it again. Would for seven days, starting tomorrow, Monday through Sunday, when you come back again next week with somebody with you, that you start your normal time with Jesus in a few minutes of silence. No agenda, no no, nothing, just sitting before God saying, I'm here. What would that look like? I'm saying, what could go wrong? But let's end up with our final point. Let's wrap this up. Final point is kind of an action step. Would you pray for your family? Pray your family will point people to Jesus. Pray your family will point people to Jesus. Can I ask a question? Because this is, I'm gonna get vulnerable. This is something I struggle with. A lot of times I pray for the needs and the things that are going on in my life what I need God to do for me. But I don't know that I always spend time in prayer going, God, would you use me to point somebody to Jesus? I mean, this is what I do. This is what I pray for. This is what I prepare. But just in my life out when going to kids' basketball games or soccer practices, man, would I say, God, let me be used to point people to Jesus? Or do I pray for my wife? God, will you use her 
to point somebody to Jesus? Do I look at my middle schooler or my high schooler and go, God, I, I'm not so much concerned about their grades or their athletic achievements or their popularity at the moment, but God, I want them to be used by you. God, would you let my family point people to Jesus? I mean, that's where we need to be. Is that part of our prayer? When you look at Zechariah and Elizabeth, who, who for years prayed, God, would you answer this? And they felt forgotten, but they stayed faithful. They encountered the, the, the angel, and the angel says, God has heard, and he's going to answer. And there's all of these things with his silence, with her hidden pregnancy, with all of these things. But if you hit the fast forward button, through several years, you'll get to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34, we get a glimpse into John's ministry, Zechariah and Elizabeth's promised son. It says in verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, uh, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descended from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Church, a faithful husband and wife serving the Lord, praying in all earnest, feeling no relief, feeling no answer, feeling confusion and doubt, yet they chose to trust God's answer even if it's not the one they wanted, God's timing even if it's not what he would choose, and God's plan and purpose to be more than just giving us what we're comfortable with. And Zechariah and Elizabeth are probably not gonna be in too many manger nativity scenes. But God took a couple and gave them a child that said, I want everybody to know this is the son of God, pointing people to Jesus. Church, would you take serious Yona Dahlonega praying that God would use you and your family like Zechariah, Elizabeth, and John the Baptist to say, that's the son of God. He takes away the sins of the world. He is who he says he is. God started a conversation with Zechariah through an angel of your prayers have been heard. And he was going to involve Zechariah and Elizabeth in his plan to redeem men to himself. It wouldn't have been the path they've chosen. It wouldn't have been the timing they would have accepted. But I bet they were sure glad it was God's plan and not theirs to see generations impacted for the gospel at the testimony of their son saying, that's him pointing people to Jesus. So my question as we end our time together today is this. What conversation do you need to have with Jesus today? Do you need to have a, a conversation of submission to God's answer? That when you've prayed that God may say no and say, God, I trust you. Or maybe you need to have a, a prayer of a conversation with God about strength to wait because God's timing is not yet. 
Maybe you need to have a conversation of, God, I'm done trying to force my way. You just tell me and I'll go. You need to step up and step out. Or maybe you need to have a conversation of repentance and faith with the Lord. If there's someone here today or at Dahlonega or Yona that doesn't know Jesus, I want to tell you this. There is a God. There is one God, holy and powerful, mighty and righteous. And then there's you and me. Selfish, broken, rebellious, And in God's perfection, he must handle sin. Scripture says, for the wages of sin is death. We will die and spend eternity separated from God in hell because of our sin. But in God's great grace, he sent his son Jesus, which is what we're celebrating at Christmas. That God sent his Savior one who would live perfectly, born of a virgin, would take our sin and shame and pay our debt at the cross, be buried in a tomb, and then conquer death. And anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so that's my invitation today with everybody's heads bowed and their eyes closed. If you need Jesus today, I wanna ask you to pray something like this. God, you're good and I'm not. I confess my sin. I confess my rebellion. And I understand the consequences that come with my sin. But God, I also believe that your son Jesus died and paid for my sin. He not only died, but he conquered death. And God, today, in the best way that I know how, I turn my back on my sin and I put my faith in Jesus. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. God, I ask that you would save me today. And if that's you, I want to say welcome to the family of God. Before you leave at any campuses, grab one of the campus pastors, head to a Next Steps booth just before you leave. Tell somebody what God is doing in your life. God, we love you. We thank you for the conversation that Gabriel had with Zechariah. We're thankful for the the testimony of John the Baptist that there is the Lamb of God. And we praise you for moving in our midst and our testimonies in Christ that we have been changed and made new. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Now, church, before we go, we've got one final song. But before we get there, I want you to do something for me. I want everybody to stand up right where you are. And I want you to take a posture of surrender, whatever that may be for you. It may be hands up, maybe hands out. But I want you just to have a conversation with God and just stop holding on to all of these things. And without the pride of somebody's gonna look at me, my hands are up, you understand I'm a Baptist, right? But I want you just to get in a posture of surrender before God and say, God, here's the conversation I need to have with you. God, I'm weary. I'm tired. God, I don't believe that you're going to answer me. Why would I struggle with this medical thing all these years? Why would my wayward child or spouse never come to you? God, what are you? God, surrender, repentance. Maybe some of you just haven't talked to God in a while and you just need to open up that line of conversation again. But right now, I'm just gonna ask you, get in that posture. We're gonna give you 20 or 30 seconds and just you have a conversation with God and then we'll sing together. Y'all cool with that? Let's pray.